you. I want to spend a few minutes telling you just three things. The first is a personal story, and then I'm going to try and persuade you of something before finally trying to give you an idea, because TED is about ideas that are worth spreading, and I hope you'll find my idea is worth spreading. Just a bit of context, first of all. I had an unusual educational background. It all started normally in school in Norfolk, but quite quickly in my early years, I was sent to hospital with an undiagnosed condition, and I stayed there for several months. At one stage, I remember going under general anaesthetic twice in the same week, which is quite a lot to go through. My parents gave me some projects to keep me occupied, and I can't really remember much about those projects. I don't think it really was about the content. I remember one had something to do with dried flowers, but that really wasn't the point. At the end of hospital, when it was time to go back to school, I really didn't want to go. I knew I was smart, but school made me feel stupid. And I was really lucky that my parents agreed with me. They lost faith in the system, and they voted with their feet. And so, between the ages of five and 12, I was educated completely at home. I was lucky for a second time then, because I was able to get one of the last assisted places in the country before the scheme was abolished to go to the Norwich School, where I spent the rest of my educational school years. When I was taught at home, I got quite used to a few things, and one of the things I got used to was being asked frequently asked questions. Now, the first most frequently asked question was, why aren't you in school? And funnily enough, the second most frequently asked question was, isn't that illegal? And I became quite adept at answering the relevant section of the Education Act, which says that each and every child is entitled to an education suitable to his or her age, ability, and aptitude, whether at school or otherwise. And it's the aptitude bit that I think is so important when it comes to breeding more crazed fantasists. Aptitude is a funny idea. It's much more about what's in you than what can be put into your brain. It's about natural predisposition or tendencies, and it takes careful nurturing and a hell of a lot of self-confidence to bring out. So, crazed fantasists, that idea, that word, where does it come from? Well, it's a phrase that was coined by me and Guy Browning, who I made the film with, back in 2009 when we were planning this crazy project. And I have to confess, we didn't have a clue what we were doing. We had no experience of making movies, we had very little experience of doing anything in the film industry, and yet we had an idea and we had the confidence to give it a go. Now, it helped that Guy knew quite a lot of good jokes, and uh, I also had some experience making things happen. And, as you know, we had the huge help of an entire village, and they really did make the film. Everything from putting up the cast and crew who were professionals in their homes, through to driving people from place to place. The Women's Institute did all the catering, and uh, even the local hair salon opened at 5 a.m. in order to get all the cast through hair and makeup. But Guy and I didn't have a clue, and had we known at the beginning what it would be involved, we probably would never have started. And also, I think our naivety completely protected us because we had no idea of the high likelihood of failure of this project, but we just had an idea and the confidence to make it happen. Now, I happen to think that experience can be a very dangerous thing. And when I look at the problems that we face as a world, and I look at the people who are supposedly experienced and in positions of power tasked with solving those problems, I have, frankly, very little hope that they have the right answers. These are big problems. We are struggling with a world that has been transformed in the past 75 years, but the solutions apparently are in institutions that are nearly a century old. This worries me, and the only way we're going to find solutions to these problems is with big, new ideas. We desperately need radical, reality-blind, crazed fantasists to come up with the solutions to these problems. And that's why I'm here with you today, to try and convince you of this idea and tell you about how we can get more of them. Now, Einstein once said that his gift for fantasy had meant more to him than his ability to retain positive knowledge. He was probably the craziest of all the fantasists, but he was a one-off, right? It's quite hard to find these people. It's particularly hard to train them. When you think about the Education Act and that age, ability, and aptitude thing, the age and ability, you can kind of solve those institutionally. But aptitude, that's surely about the individual. The only way to deliver an education to an individual's aptitude is to cater for them individually. That's incredibly hard at scale. Now, it can be difficult to even find crazed fantasists out in the real world. They're quite easy to find in banking, 
But in all seriousness, when you want to solve a problem, it sometimes helps by bringing people in from the outside with fresh perspectives and diverse experiences. And in education, I really believe that Teach First has done that in a number of occasions. But that's surely just the beginning. Now, I'm also mindful that I don't want to stand here talking to educators and even be in danger of suggesting that you do more. I think it would be completely impossible and utterly unreasonable to expect educators to do more. But I do think we could do a few things slightly differently and help bring out some of the aptitudes in our young people. They may be difficult to find, but it doesn't take much time. It just needs the right time and the right sorts of people. Now, before I deliver my idea for you to deride, discuss, and hopefully spread, I want you to think back to your experience of education, whether you had teachers or otherwise, and think about moments of experience that really resonate with you, special teachers or powerful memories. We've all got them, I think, in the room, and I think also, I'd bet my bottom dollar that the reason those memories for you are so powerful is they were aligned with powerful moments of self-realization times or instances where a teacher or some other adult took time to talk to you, to spot in you something unique to you, some aptitude, and help you recognize it for the first time, and maybe even give you the confidence to help bring it out of yourself. These moments of self-realization snap together like magnets, and they are powerful, and they make us who we are. So, my big idea. Well, the first problem is it's almost certainly illegal, but how many radical ideas were legal when they were first conceived? The second thing is it's very personal to me from my experience both being educated at home and at the Norwich School and noticing strikingly how few of the people that taught me had any formal teaching qualifications whatsoever. My idea is called Teach Last. And it's a bit like Teach First in that it takes people from outside of the school environment and brings them in. But rather than being at the beginning of their careers, doing it right at the end, when they've already had the rich, interesting, diverse life experiences, they've already built up stuff that sometimes we callously or easily call wisdom, but which is to do with their own self-knowledge and their own self-confidence. This often makes them experts at identifying and bringing out the same in young people. Out there, I believe, are tens of thousands of potential crazed fantasists, and denying them the opportunity to have their abilities recognized and their aptitudes identified and to be given the confidence to have them drawn out of themselves is a greater tragedy even than bulldozing the rainforest that might contain the elixir. Would-be crazed fantasists need very little, but they do need one thing, and that is self-confidence. Thank you. Mm-hmm.